a notification appeared, commending you for successfully defeating the boss of the Nightmare Village for the first time. In recognition of this achievement, he received 30 free stat points, along with an additional 10 free stat points and 50 experience points for defeating the Nightmare King through melee attacks. Yu's consecutive level up earned him 10 more free stat points. With the notifications concluded, the group witnessed the gradual disappearance of the Nightmare King, its form cracking from within as it succumbed to defeat. A final notification announced to all students that the hidden mission to vanquish the Nightmare King had been accomplished. The rewards for completing the mission would be distributed based on the player's performance ratings. The system began assessing the completion rate and levels of the players. Despite their initial hesitations, everyone felt a sense of satisfaction at having successfully completed the hidden mission. Following the completion of the system evaluation, Zhao was assigned a D rank and rewarded with the Spring Breeze and Willow talent. Zuo, earning a C rank, received the same talent, along with Yang, who also attained a C rank and gained ground explosion magic. Similarly, Ma Fei achieved a C rank and was granted the talent known as Separating the World with One Strike Attack. In contrast, Chao Yu stood out, securing an impressive A rank and earning 50 experience points in addition to a B ranked skill book titled Withering Magic. With the defeat of the Nightmare King, a portal materialized once more before Yu, reminiscent of the occurrence following his victory over the Skeleton King. Internally, Yu cheekily urged the deceased Nightmare King to yield valuable items. As he reached into the portal, he retrieved a resplendent golden sword emitting a radiant yellow glow. This weapon, dubbed the Dragon Piercing Sword, was classified as B-rank equipment. Notably, it bolstered the player's attack by 100 points and disregarded 30% of opponent's armor. Furthermore, it augmented sword damage by 20% and imposed no cooldown restrictions. However, its use was confined to fighter class players above level 11. Yu was annoyed, thinking about why the Nightmare King would drop a B-ranked sword. On the other hand, the class monitor's mouth started watering as he saw the golden sword glittering in the hands of his rival, Yu. Seeing this behavior, Chao Yu threw the sword towards Ma Fei, as he was the only fighter among their group who used a sword. Even the class monitor was not able to understand this weird gesture of his opponent. He couldn't believe that Yu was giving him a B-ranked sword so easily. He knew that no matter how much the players were ready to spend, it was not easy to buy such expensive B-ranked equipment. If Ma Fei ever sold the sword Yu gave him, he would be able to get a house in the capital easily. Yu was getting annoyed and told the class monitor that he did not care what he did with the sword Yu gave him. Frustration simmered within Yu as he scrutinized the portal. Disappointed by the single piece of equipment dropped by the Nightmare King, which proved to be of no use to him. Admitting defeat, he resigned himself to examining his stat page to gauge his progress post-battle. Analysis revealed a substantial increase in strength, yet the persistent concern over his mere 70 HP weighed heavily on him. Aware that even a single blow from a high-level adversary could prove fatal, he grappled with the passive limitations imposed by the miracle of might, hindering allocation of attribute points to stats other than strength. Resigned to his circumstances, Yu resolved to prioritize strategies for self-preservation. With the mission now concluded, the system promptly announced their return to the real world. In a swift transition, Yu and his companions found themselves back on the academy campus. Elation radiated from every student, their relief palpable as they welcomed Yu and his friends back to their world. The collective joy at their safe return underscored the profound impact of their heroic actions. Rushing toward Yu, the principal sought assurance of their well-being, revealing their absence of two days had caused considerable concern, almost leading to a loss of hope for their return. Relieved by their safe homecoming, he inquired about their venture into the Nightmare Village, informed it was merely a triggered hidden mission necessitating completion. His conjecture proved correct, eliciting his satisfaction and congratulations to the students whom he deemed exceptionally fortunate. Anticipating a competitive frenzy among top universities vying for their enrollment, he lauded them as five remarkable talents emerging from a single class, heralding a promising future as a cohort of prodigies. Amidst the general jubilation, even the class monitor shared in the joy, observing Yu's smile alongside the principal with a sense of determination. 
vowing to capitalize on the power of the dragon-piercing sword, bestowed upon him by Yu, he harbored ambitions of swiftly eclipsing Yu's prowess, propelled by the formidable advantage of his newfound equipment. A member of the school administration urgently approached the principal, announcing the unexpected arrival of representatives from Huing University and Jiangdu University, seeking the five students who had recently returned from completing the hidden mission in the Nightmare Village. The principal, taken aback by this revelation, had yet to formally report the student's return, finding amusement in the university's prompt knowledge. Despite his outward demeanor, inwardly, he felt gratified to conclude his teaching career on such a positive note. Approaching the principal, two unfamiliar figures clad in blazers and coats extended simultaneous handshakes, introducing themselves as Teacher Pang and Pei, representing their respective universities. Pang wasted no time in assessing Yu and his companions, recognizing them as the exceptional talents who had successfully tackled the Nightmare Village mission. Pei, visibly irked, criticized Pang's eagerness to recruit the students without assessing their abilities first. Pang, undeterred, justified his approach as a display of earnestness characteristic of Shangdu University. He challenged Pei to conduct his own assessment if he harbored doubts about the students' capabilities, taunting him to confirm their potential through test results. Pei introduced himself as the recruitment officer from Huaqing University, outlining the forthcoming assessment aimed at determining the students' aptitude and adaptability to various scenarios. He assured the students that the evaluation would encompass a range of criteria, including their individual stats, to ascertain their eligibility for admission to the university. While all five students expressed readiness to undergo the test, Yu harbored a hint of concern upon learning that their abilities within their designated roles would be scrutinized. Knowing that he would be unable to utilize his necromancer skills under such circumstances, Yu felt a twinge of apprehension. Nevertheless, Driven by his determination to gain entry to Jingdu University and unravel the mystery surrounding his parents' disappearance, Yu resolved to persevere through the assessment. The instructors asked all five of the students about who wanted to be tested first from them. As Ma Fei was the class monitor, he confidently took out his sword and told the instructors that he will give the test first. He introduced himself as Ma Fei, a swordsman disciple with a B-rank talent and a level of five. Instructor Peng of Jingdu University was surprised when he looked at the class monitor. He was already level 5 despite having only completed the beginner's training, and on top of that, he even had a B-ranked talent. According to the instructor, Ma Fei was so good-looking and tall, he even looked like he was to be in the Jingdu University. Instructor Pei stood resolutely, his hand raised in preparation. As a level 25 gunman disciple, he boasted impressive statistics, a strength of 300, defense of 152, agility of 53, and spirit of 24, with a robust HP pool of 500. Manifesting a shield before him, Pei issued a challenge to Ma Fei, inviting him to test his prowess. In response, Ma Fei chuckled, cautioning the instructor as he unsheathed his sword and executed the world's separating strike, effortlessly shattering Pei's defensive barrier. Pei, Taken aback by the unexpected display of skill from a novice, struggled to comprehend how his defense could be breached. Despite his proficiency as a level 25 gunman disciple, Pei found himself admiring Ma Fei's technique, acknowledging the rarity of the shield-breaking maneuver and its augmentation of sword attacks. Graciously accepting Pei's commendation, Ma Fei expressed gratitude for the recognition. Observing the exchange, Peng chimed in speculating on Ma Fei's formidable strength, noting his ability to penetrate Pei's shield. Surmising Ma Fei's strength to be at least 35 points, Peng also remarked on his impressive agility. As praise for their class monitor reverberated among the students, Pei discerned Pang's underlying agenda, suspecting an attempt to entice the exceptional students back to Jingdu University. Pei interrupted the other instructor, asking Ma Fei about his decision about the university he wanted to join also telling him that the doors of Hua King University would always be open for him. Peng interrupted Pei again, telling Ma Fei to come to Jingdu University, as they would provide him with the best resources possible. The instructors didn't know that they were fighting for an ignorant mister to damage, but anyways, Ma Fei gently declined their request, telling them that he wanted the others to get tested first, as he wanted some time to think. But deep inside, he had already decided that he will join the university which would be chosen by his rival, Chao Yu.
agreeing to his request, the instructors decided to continue the test. Again, they called out the next student, and it was Zhao's turn. She showed her talent to the instructor by using her fresh breeze attack. Pei was surprised when he came to know that the girl was able to heal the whole party, despite only being level 4. Next was the meat shield girl, Zuo. She materialized her huge shield in front of the instructor, and as he attacked the shield, he was getting his attack inflicted upon him. He was shocked to know that Zuo possessed such strong defensive ability, despite only being level 4. He inquired more about her ability. She told him that this was her D-rank talent, damage reflecting armor spikes. The instructor complimented her by saying that for someone with a shield roll, there was nothing more useful than the talent of reflecting the damage they receive. Yang stepped forward for his turn, prepared to demonstrate his abilities. The instructor, making assumptions based on Yang's appearance, presumed he would fulfill the role of a meat shield. However, Yang swiftly corrected the instructor, asserting his role as a mage. Taken aback by Yang's declaration, the instructor couldn't reconcile the image of a hefty individual with the concept of a mage. Yang, offended by the implicit stereotype, unleashed his attack without hesitation. As the test commenced, the instructor was puzzled by Yang's unconventional approach, unable to discern any traces of traditional magic. With a solemn demeanor, Yang uttered the incantation for his spell. Ground Explosion Magic Suddenly the ground beneath the instructor erupted with a deafening boom, catching both the instructor and the surrounding students off guard. Startled by the unexpected manifestation of Yang's talent, the instructor realized his oversight in assessing Yang's abilities. Yang's unique talent, undetected by conventional means, posed a significant threat as demonstrated by the instructor's loss of 3 HP without prior warning. Contemplating the implications of Yang's power, the instructor resolved to closely monitor the student's progress, recognizing the principal's achievement in nurturing five exceptional talents within a single academic year. Finally, it was Chao Yu's turn to undergo the test. Instructor Pei addressed him, intrigued by the fact that Yu's talent ranking remained undisclosed. Peng, similarly taken aback, noted that Yu was two levels higher than his peers, but harbored doubts about the secrecy surrounding his talent ranking. He speculated that Yu might be concealing a low talent rank due to embarrassment. Without further delay, the instructor proceeded with the test, querying Yu about the type of undead creatures he could summon. Determined not to suffer repeated injuries, the instructor braced himself, resolving to withstand any potential attacks from the new disciple. Much to his surprise, the instructor witnessed Yu charging towards him with clenched fists. Expecting an imminent close-range deployment of a powerful necromancy technique, the instructor braced himself. However, he was caught entirely off guard when Yu delivered a forceful right hook, surpassing expectations of physical prowess for a necromancer. The instructor, underestimating Yu's strength in hand-to-hand -hand combat, found himself airborne after being struck by the formidable blow which inflicted 200 damage upon him. As a result, he was propelled backward and landed far from Yu's position, leaving the spectators, including the principal and instructor Peng, astonished by the unexpected turn of events. Witnessing Yu's ability to incapacitate a level 25 instructor with a single strike left them incredulous. Instructor Peng, in disbelief, admonished Pei, remarking on his humiliation at the hands of a mere level 7 necromancer. This incident underscored the widely acknowledged notion that necromancers typically possess the least physical prowess among all roles. Peng voiced doubts regarding Pei's impartiality, suggesting a possible familial connection between Yu and Pei that might have influenced the leniency shown in the assessment. Conversely, Pei vehemently refuted any accusations of bias, affirming his commitment to fair evaluations. Nonetheless, internally, the instructor grappled with the shock of Yu's powerful punch which nearly caused him to suffer a heart attack. He struggled to reconcile the discrepancy between Yu's low level and the immense force behind the blow. The students, equally amazed, questioned the plausibility of witnessing a seemingly frail individual launching a teacher into the air with a single punch. Even Peng, acknowledging the unsettling nature of Chao Yu's feat, felt relieved that it was Pei and not himself conducting the tests. Maintaining a calm demeanor, Yu inquired about the completion of his assessment, but Peng interjected, noting that Yu had yet to demonstrate his proficiency in undead magic. 
Undeterred, Yu clarified his intention to focus on physical combat akin to warriors, deeming his magical abilities secondary. For Yu, the paramount objective was gaining admission to Jingdu University, overshadowing the need to showcase magical prowess. Peng was surprised by Chao Yu's unprecedented decision to pursue a role different from his own, a rarity in educational circles. He promptly informed Yu of the need to consult the principal and requested a brief pause. Meanwhile, Pei, sensing a potential rival, hurriedly contacted the principal of Huang University. But Peng acted swiftly. He immediately reached out to the principal, recounting the remarkable feat of Yu, a mere level 7 necromancer, who incapacitated a teacher from Huang University with a single punch. Astonished by this revelation, the principal acknowledged Yu's exceptional talent as exclusive to Jingdu University. Instructing Peng to cater to Yu's every need should he choose to enroll, the principal emphasized the importance of securing Yu's admission. At the same time, Pei persistently attempted to contact his university's principal, albeit unsuccessfully. In response, the principal instructed Peng to arrange a video call between himself and Yu, expressing a personal desire to extend an invitation. Peng agreed and initiated the call, through which the principal, Ji Pingyang, appeared before Yu. Pingyang conveyed his anticipation for Yu's enrollment, highlighting the institution's prestigious history and esteemed faculty. However, before Pingyang could finish, Yu intervened, confirming his decision to join Jingdu University, leaving Pei stunned with apprehension. Finally, the principal of Huang University received Pei's call and asked him what the matter was. But Pei told the principal that he was too late and thought that the rest of the students were not too bad and he will fight for them. But the principal of Jingdu University was one step ahead. He asked all five of the students to join together as they were from the same class. Hearing this, all the students were so happy that they agreed to the proposition of the principal. Pei was shook to the core by this revelation as his plan was shattering completely in front of him bit by bit. He started cursing the Jingdu University for taking all the five prodigies for themselves. Seeing that reaction, Peng stood proudly with his eyes gleaming as that day was the highlight of his admissions career. But before Principal Pingyang cut the call, Yu wanted to ask a few more questions to him. He asked the principal if he knew his father, Chao An King. The principal was struck to the core hearing that name and asked Yu if he was the son of Chao An King and Bai Shixia. He told Yu that he was able to feel a strong sense of familiarity from him but was not able to quite place it. Before Yu repeated his question with a serious tone this time, asking the principal if he knew where his parents were. But the principal informed him that even if his parents were both his university students, he haven't seen them in over ten years. He was only able to tell Yu that his parents were very talented individuals. The principal harbored concerns about the whereabouts of the two individuals, fearing they may have perished after a decade of absence. However, he refrained from voicing these apprehensions to Yu directly. Instead, he conveyed his inability to obtain further information about them since their graduation. Suddenly recalling discussions about Yu's parents' private world, the principal urged Yu to explore it, suggesting that it held something left behind by his parents before their disappearance. Before ending the call, the principal informed all five students that he would send their acceptance letters directly once they were finalized. Additionally, he advised them to successfully navigate the worlds associated with their respective roles before the commencement of school, as doing so would earn them greater respect upon admission. Wishing the students good luck, the principal then vanished into thin air. One week later, the fourth college separated all the students into classes according to their roles in the other world. It was helpful in an intensive preparation of the students to get scouted by elite universities easily. We come outside the gate of the mag's class of the fourth college. The principal was present there once again, telling the students that today was the day when they will enter a world specifically designed for mages. He added that the world of mages was usually a test of the student's mental ability and should be based on logic or riddles. The principal assured them that as long as they worked together, they would be able to pass the test. However, the chairs designated for Yang and Xiao Yu remained unoccupied indicating their absence from the class. As the principal commenced explaining the passing criteria, the scene transitioned to Chao Yu and Yang standing before a captivating NPC and a portal crafted from ancient stones emitting a brilliant blue glow. Yu queried Yang about their ability to undertake the task. 
but Young, disenchanted with the theoretical discussions in class, sought practical application. He reasoned with Yu that the more individuals entering the specialized world together would significantly elevate its difficulty. Hence, it was preferable for just the two of them to tackle it. Yang cheerfully remarked to Yu that by sparing him the burden of carrying the entire class, he was doing Yu a favor. Moreover, Yang suggested to Yu that if he desired to increase his workload, he could undertake the specialized world multiple times, albeit without additional rewards. Yang expressed great enthusiasm for the AI NPC before him, informing her of their intention to explore the specialized world for mages, alongside his friend, Chiao Yu. Acceding to their request, the elf NPC instructed the system to retrieve a world tailored for two mage players. Subsequently, the portal's hue transformed from blue to a purplish tint, indicating the creation of a new specialized world for two players. This world was dubbed the Cave of Ten Thousand Poisons. Upon seeing this, Yu hurried towards the portal, but Yang stopped him, asking him if he was not going to listen to the mission instructions. Surprised by this, Yu asked Yang if there were even instructions to clear the dungeon. Yang was baffled when he heard these words from the mouth of his friend. He immediately asked Yu about how he passed the Cave of Skeletons when he never heard about the instructions. Yu gave an idiotic smile, and Yang immediately understood that Yu just made his path by killing and slaughtering the skeletons on the way. The elf started narrating a story to both of them in a serious voice. The legend has it that there was an ancient evil tribe in Xiandonggan. Its people are vicious and merciless. They are so good at using poisonous worms that they can poison the players without anyone knowing. A poisoned person will grow deathly sick, and the poisonous worms will reproduce in their body, eating their flesh until the host dies. The mission's objectives were to find the evil tribe of legend and to destroy all the poisonous worms. The rewards for the mission would be decided based on the way Yang and Yu complete the mission. The elf even gave them a gentle reminder that the cave of 10,000 poisons required five players to start. As they were short of three players, the system will automatically match them with three other players. As Chao Yu and Yang got through the portal, they teleported at an ominous-looking place along with three strangers. When they looked ahead of them, there was a giant wall with cracks which had a huge gate made out of heavy metal attached to it. As the three newcomers looked at Chiao Yu and Yang, a boy was frustrated by them, warning them to not drag the three down with them. But the girl from their team shuts the boy up, telling him that it was fate that Yu and Yang matched together with the three of them. She introduced herself as Fang Yuan, a fire mage and the boy besides her was his little brother, Fang Shun, and he was also a fire mage like her. The third person, or the annoyed brat, was named Long Chong. Yang and Yu introduced them as to the three and wished themselves good luck for the future. As they reached in front of the huge gate, the girl read the five words written above its frame that said, Morality and integrity provide peace. The girl understood that those five words on the pillar should be instructions to open the door but the brat told them that he doesn't care about some instructions. He will instead break the door down with his magic. But his overconfidence was shattered because when he attacked the gate with his spell, it had no effect on it. The girl was not surprised, thinking that the door must have some kind of immunity to magic. But the brat was baffled when he came to know that he really had to use his brain a little, and there was no other way. Or was there? On the other hand, when Yang knew that the door was immune to magic, Something clicked inside his brain. The girl finally knew the answer to a part of the riddle. She told everyone that morality and integrity signified protection, but it was all useless because used his miracle of might to punch the door down into pieces. The three players were baffled, and the girl stopped in between her deciphering process. The brat was not able to believe that you once shot a door physically with so much ease. The system told you that his answer was correct, and the door was finally open. As always, Yang complimented his brother Yu. But in reply to it, Chiao Yu told Yang that he just wanted to see if he could push the door open physically, but he never realized that the door was actually this weak. Finally, all five of them entered through the broken gate and arrived another place full of red flowers. They saw that there was another door at the other side of the garden. But you noticed something and told everyone that the flowers looked too unnatural to him and advised the others to be careful. But you looked at his hand and told you that it was already too late. 
All five of the students were poisoned even before they knew how it happened. The poison inflicted three damage to their HP every minute. Observing the situation, Yang found himself in a state of panic, seeking guidance from Yu on how to proceed. Yu advised him to keep advancing, cautioning that lingering near the flowers would only lead to death. However, internally, Yu felt the most apprehensive, realizing that if the poison continued to spread, his HP wouldn't endure for even half an hour. While the three newcomers deliberated on how to overcome this obstacle, Yu felt pressed for time. Taking matters into his own hands, he charged toward the door and forcefully broke it open, declaring that he couldn't afford to waste any time. The three newcomers were astonished by Yu's actions, expecting a puzzle-solving challenge but finding themselves bypassing it without a moment's thought. The system extended its congratulations to the players for successfully completing Mission 1, leading them to uncover the malevolent tribe of legend known as the Cave of Ten Thousand Poisons. The students were taken aback to learn that the picturesque location they found themselves in bore the ominous name of the Cave of Ten Thousand Poisons. As they searched for their next course of action, a blue-haired young girl named Za Dong suddenly appeared behind them. Introducing herself, Dong inquired if the students hailed from the outside world, only to notice that all five of them were afflicted by poison. Recognizing the source as Bayan Flowers, she urged them to swiftly follow her back to the Cave of Ten Thousand Poisons, assuring them of treatment. She cautioned that once the poison penetrated too deeply, medical intervention would be futile. The mysterious appearance of the girl left everyone astonished, with Yu particularly bewildered by her sudden presence and timely mention of the Cave of Ten Thousand Poisons. The fiery girl suggested prioritizing treatment for the group, given their uncertainty about their next steps. Without delay, Dong dashed toward a nearby village, calling out to her parents and informing them of her guests. As her mother prepared to inquire about the strangers, Dong quickly interjected, explaining that they were travelers she encountered while gathering medicinal plants in the mountains. She relayed that the travelers had been poisoned by bane flowers and requested her mother to prepare a pot of five poison soup for them. Dong's mother swiftly ushered the students into the house and began brewing the soup. After a short while, Dong returned with her parents, bearing a tray with the completed five poison soup. Dong's mother served the unappetizing concoction, containing various unsavory ingredients, to the students. One of the students hesitated at the sight of the repulsive soup, suggesting that Yang should taste it first, due to his supposedly sturdier constitution. However, Yang retorted that his apparent resilience was merely a result of excess fat, rather than robust physique. Suddenly, Yu took the bowl of wannabe soup into his hand and gulped it down in one shot. He had to drink it quickly because he only had half of his HP left. Once Yu finished his soup, he told everyone that the soup was not too salty or too bland and tastes great. He told them that the five poison soup was really helpful for him because his poison status was now disappeared. He started persuading the others to also drink up their soups and heal themselves fast. But as soon as they drank the mysterious stew, they started vomiting and feeling uneasy. Disregarding their predicament, Yu inquired about the history of the Cave of Ten Thousand Poisons from Dong. Dong admitted her lack of knowledge about the tribe's origins, but mentioned their patriarch's decree to shun the outside world and refrain from unnecessary use of their poison magic. Dong's mother examined the outsiders and assured them that the poison had been neutralized, rendering them safe. Encouraging a swift departure, she cautioned about the inhospitable nature of the Cave of Ten Thousand Poisons residents. Yet, Dong opposed her mother's counsel, advocating for extending hospitality to their guests. She invited the students to unwind and stay as long as they desired. Yu expressed gratitude to the mother and daughter, clarifying their group's brief stay due to poisoning effects. Nonetheless, he couldn't shake his bewilderment over Dong's parents' peculiar conduct. As Dong and her parents prepared to leave, they assured the outsiders of their extended stay. Suddenly, they noticed the vast full moon tinted with crimson, sparking Dong's excitement at the impending full moon night. As we wrap up this chapter, I hope you've enjoyed today's installment. If you did, please consider hitting the like button to help us reach our goal of 150 likes. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications to stay updated whenever we release new content. Thank you for watching.